Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Tuesday takedown. Never people just have bad ideas, bad arguments, and bad apologetics. And today we're going to flip the script. We're going to take the bad arguments part of that, and we're going to apply it to an atheist. This atheist, who is also a scientist, was on the Unbelievable podcast. This is a few years old at this point. His name is Peter Atkins, and he's going up against Hugh Ross, who is the believer. And of course, it's moderated by Justin Brierly. And I think I'm saying his last name correctly. I've actually read Justin's book, Unbelievable, why he is still a Christian after 10 years of speaking with atheists, and it's pretty interesting. I think that could make for its own videos, but this isn't going to be about Hugh. This isn't going to be about Justin. Today, we're going to be talking about Peter. I think he is going too far with some of his answers here, and there's not leaving any room for nuance. I think this could and should be answered better. So it's a three minute clip in total. We're going to take it in parts and I want to look at it from the angle of what I wish he would have said or what I might say. I think they're interesting questions and they deserve a little more exploration than Peter was willing to give them. So let's take a look. Some people might accuse you of being so committed to atheism that you'd never be willing to countenance any evidence that might lend support to a creator behind the universe. So I'm just interested what sort of evidence could science or the physical universe present to you that would make you think actually that that is evidence that there's a, a mind behind this i find that um a very difficult question if i were looking in the bible for evidence heaven forbid um <laughs> i i um, would expect to see maybe increase in entropy is equal to q reversible divided by temperature and that is, if, if there was literally an equation in the Bible, equation like in that. the Bible, rather than all this wishy-washy, okay. um, elastic writing that it pervades. All right. So, so if if there was something like that that yeah. they discovered yeah. in the Bible, then that, I'd that, think then it was probably a that, forgery. That, yeah. Well, exactly. I'll link the full video. It's about an hour. I have not watched it, so I don't have the context of what's going on before this. But Justin's question seems to be about a creator, about a God in general, not speaking about the Christian God. And yet when Peter chooses to answer it, he gives an example, which is fine if he wants to narrow in on the specifics. But he says, well, for instance, if I was reading the Bible. So he jumps from deism straight to Christianity, which kind of seems like there's an ax to grind there. Or again, maybe Christianity was the topic on hand. Since the other gentleman here, Hugh Ross, is a Christian, I could see why he's doing that. But again, I'd love to hear him just answer the question of what would convince you there's a God in general? Because again, the idea of atheism is just a lack of belief, which ideally would mean if new information became available and we don't get to control what we believe in, we're either convinced or we're not, we could be be convinced of something. I could be convinced of almost anything if there was enough evidence for it, despite how silly or impossible it seems to me. I think leprechauns are totally fictitious. I understand the lore that they come from. It's a funny story. But under the right conditions, if these things actually existed and we had good evidence of that, I would be intellectually dishonest to not believe in leprechauns. I would be having to force myself saying, no, I won't accept this. And now I would just be doing what but I am upset with religious people for doing, which is wanting to hold on to a belief despite the evidence against it. But let's get to the part where he moves it into Christianity and he says, okay, for me to believe in the Bible or to believe in Christianity via the Bible, here's what I would have needed to see in the Bible. And this answer I'm fine with had it been the actual question that was posed to him, which is something that we could not have known then, that we have absolutely been able to prove now. And for it to be obvious and direct, not super vague where you can kind of tie it to all of these things. This is the weird tension with prophecy in the Bible. It's weird. There's kind of two groups of Christians when it comes to prophecy. There's Christians that believe, okay, yep, God gave a word for people, but it's limited. It's limited to their vocabulary and their time, and it's specific to maybe what would happen in the next 50 years or 100 years, the next ruler, the next battle, and it is to be useful. It's to be helpful to those people in that time. And I think that generally speaking, that's how most prophecy in the Bible is supposed to be considered within context. But there's definitely a huge group of believers that believe that there is a ton of prophecy in the Bible that happens thousands of years later, whenever the end of the world is, etc. And it's like, if God's going to reveal that information that can't be useful to the individuals of that generation, why limit it there? Why not also give them the language to go with it, right? This is the kind of excuses they have to make for this prophecy. Oh, in John's revelation, when he's talking about the flying horses in the sky, he didn't have the verbiage to describe what he was seeing. Those would be airplanes, right? You get into all that kind of stuff, and maybe that's not the best example, but it's like giving all this power that God once 
there to be the special knowledge of the future for us in the future to be able to see and find out. And yet it is so vague and yet we have to twist it so much. And that's what Peter is alluding to, that if there's really truly divine knowledge in this book, why does it never represent itself in clear, perfect terminology? Even if the writers at the time had not understood that terminology, that's what would have made it so impressive. But we don't have that. What we do have is is we have nothing that is stated that could not have been known at the time of the writing. That, along with a thousand other things, makes it look very non-divine and very man-made. So, a totally fair request from him saying, if God wants me to believe in him via the Bible, he should have put things in the Bible that are just undeniable truth that they could not have known at that time that we have then come to find out as true. Love it. Totally agree with it. Totally fine. What I don't like is he says, well, if that happened, I would have just assumed it was a forgery. No, we could absolutely know different than this. We could absolutely, through good, objective, scholarly research, have an understanding of when it was written, if it was valid, how it was preserved, which again, this perfect divine God would have known what we needed to be able to rule out a forgery. Like if we're going to attribute some of this miraculous ideas to him, why not go all the way with it? There is absolutely a way that a God 2,700 years ago could have had his people write things down that are perfect and true for us to discover in the future and with us having the ability to know that they really were written down 2,700 years ago. Of course that could be the case. And if that were the case, especially if there weren't all the other issues that we have with the Bible, hey, we're making some really positive progress towards me believing in this God. See, this is the nuance that I think is missing from his answers here. And by the way, let me back up. The reason that I think it's important to talk about this is we have to consider why the Christian is asking in the first place. Many Christians honestly believe there's a ton of evidence for their belief system. And so when an atheist isn't convinced, then they can jump to a point of, well, what would convince you? It just seems like nothing could convince you. And if there was actually good evidence for the claims of the Bible and the Bible's validity in general, this might be a good question. But the way that I hear the question is, hey, you haven't accepted any of my claims, my assertions. You seem really hung up on all of the issues and the impossibilities and the mutually exclusive claims and the contradictions, and you're not hearing my evidence. So it's on you. You must have a bad brain. You must not want to accept it. You must be loving your sin. You must be angry at God. You must be in denial. You must not want this to be true. And we get all of these attacks simply because what I consider to legitimately, with none of this in the way, be really bad claims for their belief system. And when you have someone like Peter who says, yeah, nothing would convince me, or if there was something good, exactly what I said there should be, I chalk it up to a forgery. It's like, ah, you've given them everything they want. You've become a ridiculous person. You have become dishonest. And so I would hope to help other atheists better answer these questions, maybe also look at this with a little more openness and honesty. That is the position we say that we are taking, that we are just not convinced. That means that if if there were something that is convincing, we should be able to be convinced, right? Otherwise, we have our heads in the sand. That's not what I want. I want to follow truth wherever it leads. So that's why I wanted to be talking about these things. Let's move on and see the next thing that he says. I mean, if the stars lined up to spell Peter, please believe in me. It's about no, time. I, 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 would, I, would put, that it, I put it down to madness. Is, well, it is, sounds it, like, Peter, that there's no evidence that will persuade you away from atheism. Well, to be honest, I think that's probably the case. In that sense, Oh. Uh, do you even have an evidence-based view if you're actually committed to atheism a priori? I'm predicting that there will be no such evidence. That's not quite the same thing as being committed to it a priori. I can't. But you said there's no evidence that would persuade uh, you otherwise. I, I think it's much more likely that I would have gone mad <laughs> than such evidence would have been provided. Right. So at the end of the second clip, he gets a little closer to the nuance, but again, it could be so much better said. Let's start with the first part. If the stars aligned saying your name, believe in me, he almost immediately is like, no, I would have considered that I'd gone mad. Let me just say, I think that would work for me. If I had been seeking a particular God, as I did for 30 years, and then I left because of a lack of evidence and an abundance of issues, I think the first step back could be some kind of divine revelation. I know, as far as I can know anything, that stars aren't moving, that the light is getting to us after such an expanse of time that it wouldn't make sense for them to arrange themselves. So I would have to conclude one of two things. 
I have gone mad, or this God exists and is speaking to me directly. I think what Peter is trying to say and failing miserably at is if faced with these two conclusions, based off his level of evidence, and speaking for myself, the issues I already have with the Bible, it seems far more likely, and that's what he says towards the end of the second clip, that he had gone mad over this God existing. But again, here we're talking about a specific God claim. So maybe it's important to say what is spelled out in the stars. Is it Brandon, I am Yahweh, the God of the Bible, I am real? Or is it I, the creator, do exist? Because then I would actually have three different propositions and I would weight those differently. I still think the most likely is that I'm having an episode or someone slips something in my drink or I'm having a strange dream from 30 years of this being embedded in my psyche. And then maybe, oh, there is a creator. That's a little more plausible than to me at this point in my life with everything that I know, Yahweh existing. And again, I think that nuance is necessary. You know, if we're just blank slates, if I didn't have my history, if I didn't know the Bible so well and had seen all of the issues, if I didn't understand the contradictions in God's character and capabilities that I do from his own mouth and actions as recorded in the holy texts, it would be easier for me to believe based off these personal experiences or divine interactions. But if something like that happened, what I would have to do is map it and match it up against all of these other issues. And then to me, it becomes kind of a matter of weighing the evidence. What is most likely? What is most probable? I have some more things, but I think I want to save them for the end. I think we have either just one or two more clips here. Let's see what he says next. So in principle, it's impossible to ever persuade you that God exists. I didn't quite say that. Mm. What would persuade I, you? I suppose even if I died and was confronted with you know, St. Peter saying, Welcome to heaven. I'd probably think I was dreaming. Okay, so there's one last little part we're going to get to in a second, but this part is just a little more telling of his position. He is so unconvinced at this stage in life, based in his background of understanding how the universe works and the things we've been able to find out about the universe and measuring and observing these things, which yes, we know a lot, but if there's anything I understand about the universe, it's how much we don't understand still. And so the mystery there is still open for me. So I'm seeing a little bit of pride and ego and also just a position of seeing this thing is so ridiculous for so long that anything is more probable. And again, the example he gives falls short. He's saying, ah, if he dies and wakes up and sees St. Peter, he'll just assume he's sleeping. Well, for how long? Like at some point, play within the context of the hypothetical. You've died and you know you've died. Yeah, maybe you sit in the corner believing in it's a dream for the first 400 years. Is there truly no point of acceptance where you're like, okay, I died? there is an afterlife. And would this God, any God, be incapable of convincing you at that point to still hold to it right now? That seems silly. Now, if he was saying, hey, if I feel like I'm having a spiritual experience, I would probably want to see like, am I dreaming? Am I in a coma? Did I accidentally do some drugs? Am I under severe stress and having a delusion? Like, are there other things to consider before just jumping to a conclusion that this God or a God is real? And they keep jumping around between the biblical God and God in general, which makes it a little bit tough here. But there's a huge difference there. I agree. Other things seem more probable and they should be checked out. And I guess it's hard to check yourself out for if you're having a mental delusion. But again, I truly understand Peter's point of this hierarchy of potential possibility with God being at the extreme of that because everything else in his life points to the non-necessity for this God. But to say that there is just no instant of a tipping point, a threshold, a crossing line, where those things have been excused, that's not what's happening, and you can't be convinced, I think it's a failure of imagination. So here's how I would wrap it up. And there is one question at the end that maybe we'll get to as kind of a bonus question. And by the way, I would love to hear your guys' answers to all of this in the comments below. What would convince you? Could you be convinced? Would you want to be convinced? All of this. But here's as simple as I can state it and as honest as I think I can state it. I really believe that I could be convinced. I also am not 100% sure exactly what would convince me. And I know that this is the cop out and I've heard other people say it, but God would know what would convince me. But it's true. If this God 
who is all powerful and all knowing truly exists, then he knows what would convince me. If nothing can convince me, he's not all powerful, right? It's that simple. So just by the fact that the whole hypothetical is an all powerful God, it's dishonest to say nothing could convince me. This is actually why I have such a problem with the Christian God. And I've mentioned it a thousand times, but if he desires that we should not be lost and he wants a relationship with us and he doesn't want me burning in hell and he wants me with him in eternity and he has the knowledge of what would convince me and the power to do so, it's on him. Truly, it's on him, especially when you layer on the fact that he created me supposedly with this brain, with this mind, with this experience, with this history, with everything that would lead me up to the point of not being convinced in him any longer. How is it not his responsibility? So yes, I believe I could be convinced. I think it's the only honest position to take. I don't know exactly what would convince me, but something would, and I don't have to be the one to define what it would be. And just because the evidence that Christians or other religious groups have brought forward so far is not good enough to convince me or does not cover all of the other issues I know about clear as day does not mean that I am unreasonable, which is the leap they tried to make, which Peter is giving them tons of ammo for. And they should understand this as well as anyone else, because there are two billion people on this planet that 100% believe in the truth of Allah via the prophet Muhammad, that they believe they have good evidence and reason to believe. They believe in all the same kinds of evidence that Christians claim they have, whether it's archaeological, historical, miraculous, divine intervention, divine revelation, etc., all of it. So why aren't they convinced of the truth of Islam? And would it be fair to call them unreasonable because they haven't accepted the evidence put forward by Muslims? So that's mainly it for today. I just always want to be able to add in some nuance to the conversations. Not everything is black and white. And I try to do this for Christians as well. I don't think that I've gone easier on Peter. I do happen to agree with most of Peter's stance, which is this God should be doing a lot better if he wants us to believe in him. And it's not our fault we can't bridge the gap for all of these issues. But the last question that they ask him is, would you want to believe? Would you want to be convinced? And again, he immediately applies it to the Christian God, and then he applies it to the afterlife heaven. And he gives kind of a funny retort about heaven being boring, about needing to go down to hell for some excitement. And so, yeah, it's not that appealing of a proposition to him. And again, I understand. So there's two questions here. Would you want the Christian God to exist or would you want a God to exist in general? It would be very hard for me to want the Christian God to exist. I see too much of his character as so immoral, horrific, hypocritical, and straight up evil that no, I don't want that being being in charge of the universe. I don't want a being that has allowed this much suffering, not just allowed it. It's not some apathetic thing like he wound up creation and this is just the byproduct. He has been engaged. He has interfered. He has caused the harm, period. So could I be forced to believe that God is real? Sure. I'm not currently convinced of it now. I'm convinced of just the opposite. That based off the claims about him by his book, he is falsifiable. And even if he were true, I definitely would not want him to be or would not want to worship him. But those are totally different questions. And again, some Christians will even take those answers and twist them. Oh, see, you just hate him so much. You're just mad at him. No. If he were real, though, and he was really like the book says he is, I'm making a judgment call on him just the same as the Christian who makes the judgment call saying he's good, except I have more evidence for my claim that he's not. See all my past videos. But would I want there to be a God that exists in general? That's such a hard question. Part of me wants to look around at the state of just earth and what we know of and human suffering and say, man, any God that allowed this, that created this, even if he left it alone or he, it or she was minimal in its creation, this at best is an absentee parent. And I think on a humanity scale, we have a net loss when it comes to suffering, at least so far. And I'm not sure if there's any net gain that's great enough to actually compensate for what billions of people have had to go through in their existence on this planet. So what's the alternative, Brandon? You just would want there to have never been anything? Honestly, even though I personally love my life and I'm glad to be here and I enjoy every day and I have positive experiences despite any suffering, I think that, yeah, you'd have to wish that. And I think that's a huge question. We could spend hours breaking that down. If all of this were natural and organic, it's excusable because there's no mind 
choosing this. And so all we can do is make the best of it, which is a lot of what my Sunday video was about. Now, if you're asking me within that organic world, would you wish that a God could come in who had these properties? That's still terrifying. <laughs> What's it going to be like? What's its end goal? I mean, we'd have to define the God. We'd really have to define the God. Then we'd have to reconcile the fact that this God exists and all the suffering on this planet exists. And that's no small thing. You can be like, ah, oh, you're just so hung up. Yes, I'm hung up on that. It's inexcusable of a creator when you give the creator all of that knowledge. Now, if we're talking about a God that's limited in knowledge and limited in power and is doing the best they can with what they've got and is good or moral in so far as we can say those things, yeah, maybe it would be nice to have a Superman. Are we just talking about Superman? I'll tell you right now, I would prefer having Superman over Yahweh, someone that is capable of helping and has the right moral compass to do so? Sure, let's get as many of those as possible. But that's not what most of us think of when we think of God. We think of these triomni properties, and with that comes so much baggage and so much contradiction and so much that would need to be reconciled. I don't know how else to say it. So that's my case of nuance about if God is real, if we should want him to be real, and if we can be convinced of the fact that he is real. I hope that it opens up a conversation for more in-depth conversations in the future. I think we could take a lot of these little topics and really break them down. Again, let me know what you think in the comments. And then just really quickly, I'm actually right now, if this is playing on Tuesday at 9 a.m., like I think I'll be in the airport getting ready for a week-long business trip. I'm trying to get some video stacked, but there may or may not be a Thursday video. I'm trying absolutely to make sure there's still a Sunday video. Video. So we may just miss one week of secular Bible study series, or maybe I'll get it done. Not sure. Either way, thank you so much for being here and be patient with me. I'm so far behind on emails, on patron messages, on videos that I want to do, on responses that I owe people. I know that a lot of you have put your heart and soul into reaching out and asking for help and having a question or trying to connect with me. And I appreciate it. And maybe I should have stated this at the beginning of a video so more people have a chance to hear it, but I'll point some people to the end of this. My first priority is making my three videos a week. If I can get a Saturday video, great. I also want to be as engaged as I can in the comments. That's getting harder all the time. Keep in mind, I have a family, a social life, and a normal full-time job. The editing of these videos and everything that goes along with it, it's a lot of time requirements. So videos, then comments, patron messages, and emails. And I'm very behind. I know I won't be able to please all of you. I know some of you have expressed frustration. I'm very sorry for that. And as much as I want to connect and continue to create a community, there are just realistic limitations to my time and also a hierarchy of making sure that I have time with my wife and kids and things of this nature. So I know most of you understand all of that, but I wanted to kind of just put it out there. And that's it. I think I've rambled on long enough. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day. I'll hopefully see you Thursday. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my iconoclast, Anne, Boris, GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, my atheist advocates, Caleb, Jeffrey, Karen, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholars. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you just enjoy the content, please consider joining these fine patrons today.